Now you can get away from all this fluffy stuff because people will tell you to build a credibility package or all these fancy marketing materials. To be honest with you, you don't really need that. When you speak the lingo, you don't really need all this fancy stuff because somebody can pick up the phone in less than five minutes know whether you're the real deal or you're not the real deal. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, now offering a $250 per unit project allowance to new clients in West Michigan. Find out more at livegreenlocal.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 316. My guest today has over 10 years of global investing experience, and he's the founder of Boardwalk Wealth, with over 2,000 units bought and sold, and around 1,100 under management currently. Omar Khan is responsible for capital raising, strategic planning, and investor relations, while focusing on acquiring value-add real estate across the Southeast. Omar, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Finally, I get to meet the man. How are you? I'm doing great. I've heard a lot about you. I, I've kind of invested alongside of you, and I've been looking forward to having this conversation. For those in our audience who would like to know more about you, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and how you got started investing in real estate. Well, look, my background's in finance on the institutional side. I was structuring, running deals, both on the banking side as well as on the corporate side. But how I got started in real estate is around 20... I mean, my family's been in the business. I'm the third generation, so I've kind of grown up around the business. Uh, a few years ago, we had a tax issue, a good one. I mean, the tax game. And that time, given my family's background, my own personal and professional networks, I knew that I wanted to pay not pay excessive taxes or any taxes on it. So that's how I got into basically the multifamily aspect of the game. I've been investing and running deals earlier by myself as a principal. And after that, it was just putting one foot after the other, right? So it started off as a tax, fixing a tax problem. And then along the way, you know, I'm blessed to have so many good partners, investors, that you do one deal, you do another deal after that. And, you know, I wish I, I could tell you I had a grand plan on how things were going to happen exactly laid out. But that's not the way it happened. We had a problem, we tried to solve it, had met more great people along the way, did more deals, and just tried to put one foot after the other. Talk about the types of deals that you're doing. Where you kind of started. It's multifamily apartments is my understanding of what you're primarily invested in. I've done retail deals. I bought a couple of industrial deals, sold them. These were all buy and sell sort of deals. But the aspect that you most people probably know me for is multifamily deals. So we have assets in Texas, Georgia, and Florida. Primarily, these are value-add deals. I just started phase one of my development in South Dakota with a very old partner of mine. He lives there. It's a luxury apartment building. That's 129 units development. We'll have a phase two coming out. That's about 150, 200 units next year. And we've already started another development luxury. I think it's about 47 or 57 units. I have to look at my notes. Let's go back to your first multifamily deal. What did that look like? And what was that process like for you doing that? Very painful because again, I don't, like I told you, I had a tax gain. It was luckily at around April, May of the year. So I had a little bit of time. So I had to quickly go find the deal, number one, to mitigate their tax exposure, find the right type of partners to help me raise the equity and do all of that sort of stuff. And then put this all deal together, package it up nicely, operate it, run it, all of that stuff. So the operations part wasn't an issue because I was already doing it in my professional career. But it was putting all these disparate pieces together. And then at that time, it seemed like a monumental Herculean task. Now, for instance, like where I needed five, six people, I can do most of that thing in-house by myself. Right. As in terms of raising the equity, all of that sort of stuff. Right. So like, you know, a lot of this is one putting one foot after the other. So the first deal, the big issue was a tax issue. Right. As I explained to you. But after that, you know, you just you just keep putting your reps in. Right. You put your reps in and you learn and you move on. And uh, along the way, I've been lucky to have good vendors, professional service providers, unofficial mentors of sorts, you know, that sort of stuff. You know, my point is anybody can be a mentor, right? Some, somebody's doing something really well. You don't have to know them. You can just model yourself after them. So being exposed to the right people at the right time really hastened my advancement. This tax issue that you were solving, it sounds like you had some 1031 money that you needed to move. 
Well, no, no, no. We had another game, basically a capital game somewhere else. And basically I needed to have enough. I wish I had a 1031. That makes my life a lot easier. No, we had a very good investment in a couple of businesses that we owned. We sold them out. My share was a very nice capital gains. Shelter my capital gains. I needed tax write-offs. Because most people, I mean, in real estate, a lot of people carry tax write-offs, you know, like developers, acquisitions, guys like us. But in real life, if you're not in real estate, you don't carry like a couple of hundred thousand to a few million dollars in tax write-offs. Just hanging out, you know? So that's why I needed that, basically. That's what brought you to the multifamily. And and I take it that's because that's where you could get the greatest tax write-offs. Yes. And the other deal also was basically... That I mean, I I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm not good at. So it wasn't like I was going to suddenly build the next Facebook or Twitter or I don't know, Amazon. And then it was going to take off in the next six months that I needed. So like I explained to a lot of friends about, look, real estate is the easiest, dumbest and cleanest way to basically get a lot of tax write-offs legally without necessarily being the smartest guy in the room, which I wasn't basically. So one, you know, it's that old saying of know thyself. I knew thyself and I knew I wasn't going to create a world beating technology anytime soon. So why recreate the wheel? You did it the first time for the tax benefit, but then you did it again and again and again. Why was that? Because I like making money, uh, Brian. I've got, you know, this pretty face. This, this this quality lifestyle doesn't come cheap, Brian. I did it because, right? I mean, look, it's a good way to make a living. A lot of people, it's very funny to me. I talk to a lot of people and I know you're not like that, but a lot of people start talking, you know, anytime you ask them, hey, why are you doing something, right? Which is obviously a commercial enterprise, right? It's not like social work as an example, right? Or philanthropy, right? And these days, a lot of people tend to shy away from saying, look, man, I, I want to make money to continue providing a quality lifestyle for myself and my family. People talk about their wives and like all, I mean, look, these things are important. Don't get me wrong, but let's be clear. I mean, real estate is a good way to make money for our partners, for ourselves. It's a very stable asset class. It's been around for a long time. So it's not like, you know, something new you've got to go explain to people. So the marketing process around it is relatively simpler, right? And it's a, and most importantly, like I mentioned earlier, it's a stable source of generating long-term wealth. So when you've got all these pieces in place and it's a very lucrative profession to be in, especially the private equity part of this business, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, Brian, I mean, more money, better quality lifestyle, sign me up, man. What systems do you have in place? What is your mode of operation when it comes to finding the types of apartments that you're acquiring and how you're finding that value? I'm coming from the institutional world. So I was actually working in you know institutional sales. So I understand the sales process because look, you've got to realize whether it's real estate or a business or anything else, when you're dealing with these 30, 40, 50, 80 million dollar assets, you're dealing with this sophisticated, what is, the value chain is sophisticated, right? I mean, you're not dealing with people who have no idea about what's going on. So 99% of the deals that are sourced are sourced through brokers because I have a good relationship with them. Based on my investment sales experience, I was obviously talking their language in terms of, you know, a lot of times it's really funny that if you're talking to a newbie, very quickly you can figure out this person's a newbie, right? In the sense, not because they're not intelligent or not intelligent. Intelligence has nothing to do with it. It's a verbiage they use as an example. So, for instance, you know, somebody can say, I want a cash flowing multifamily deal in Atlanta. Well, what does that mean? I mean... Which suburb do you want it in? Do you have a vintage class, an asset, you know, unit number, dollar value? What type of business plan do you have? So for me, the business, because I've worked in investment sales, I realized you had to be very specific and you have to target a niche. So as an example, you know, for me, it was very easy to relate to brokers and talk to them because I'd been in the, on the sales side of the business, right? Just in another industry. Uh, so I was when I picked up the phone, I told guys, look, I'm looking for a value add deal, 70s and 80s vintage in XYZ submarkets. Basically, the median income in this area has to be roughly this because I'm targeting mid-teens IRR and about a 6 to 8% stabilized cash on cash, right? Now, you can get away from all this fluffy stuff because people will tell you to build a credibility package or all these fancy marketing materials. To be honest with you, you don't really need that. When you speak the lingo, you don't really need all this fancy stuff because somebody can pick up the phone and less than five minutes know whether you're the real deal or you're not the real deal. It's, it, think about it this way. It's like any every profession has its own language of sorts, right? So my wife's a physician. A lot of times when she meets her friends or physicians and they talk about whatever stuff doctors talk about, which I don't really understand, they're able to 
talk in a language which is their industry or their job's language, right? Similarly, if you're in investment sales at a certain level, whether it's real estate, private equity, and say businesses or otherwise, if you speak the language, people are more receptive to talk to you because they know that they don't have to go explain the basics to you. Right. And frankly, most brokers or any financial intermediaries in between, they're so inundated with calls and volume of business that what they don't want to do is go explain the basics to somebody when they might as well do two or three transactions in that time because everybody's time is very precious. You've got to realize these top brokers in every market, dude, they're easily clearing over a million dollars. Easy in a bad year. Okay. They don't have time. So you got to cut to the chase and you got to. You just you literally have to just cut to the chief. I'd imagine that there is a learning curve to speaking that language. You come from a greater financial background. I worked in investment banking and all of that stuff. So I had I had worked up to that level, right? It just so happened that circumstances happened and I moved into this industry. But the building blocks were already there because I was doing the work to begin with. And by the way, I'm not a unique case. Most people who work in MA, investment banking, equity research, portfolio management on the corporate side or the bank side, they'll be speaking that language anyways, because that's that's their profession. How do our listeners who don't feel confident in that, that area build that muscle? Well, number one, you've got to realize, like, you know, the conversation we had earlier, know thyself. I mean, obviously, nobody knows thine self 100%. But you realize, look, look, I have some partners who are fantastic in marketing. Marketing in the sense of, for instance, relating better, being able to better relate to individual investors, their needs, both current and emerging. Something they might think about two months from now, they, they'll already sense it out right now, right? So you've got to realize, is this your forte? Because don't force yourself to do something. For instance, if this is not your forte, try to find a partner whose forte is this thing, right? So this way you can leverage their strengths and they can leverage your strengths. So number one is to try to figure out, hey, is this your forte or not? And if this is your forte, as an example, or if this is not your forte, then the answer is pretty simple, partner with the right person. And if this is not your forte, then what I would suggest is that instead of jumping head first, taking people's money, and that can get dicey, you know, because you don't know how to manage it. That's another set of issues you've got to deal with, ethical and otherwise. Try to work in an industry where you're used to these things. You're used to an analytical framework. And it doesn't have to be banking. It could be corporate finance. It could be a lot of other things. But till you're not immersed in this thing day in and day out, I'm not saying it's impossible, right? Because look, eventually, if you're the richest guy in the world, you can show up with like a bag of money and beat everybody, right? (laughs) But immerse yourself in the industry a little bit more before you start picking up the phone and pounding phone calls. Right. Because when you are dealing with brokers, it's a very different sort of a sales process than dealing with investors. And it's not like you can or can't do it. Everybody can eventually do it. Look, this isn't rocket science. But the fact is, do you want to spend your time doing it? Or is your time better spent doing something where you're a rock star and you can hire somebody who's a rock star in this realm? And this way, you don't hold yourself back unnecessarily. Right. Anyone who listens to this show knows that Green Property Management manages my entire West Michigan residential portfolio. They manage single families all the way up to large apartment complexes. Marty and his team are running a new special that I think is absolutely nuts. And I tried to tell him so, but he wouldn't listen to me. They want to offer new clients a $250 per unit project allowance to have their in-house licensed crew tackle any project, big or small, for new clients. I can tell you from personal experience that their unique management style will save you money, eliminate headaches, and increase your net operating income. You add on top of that this limited time offer of $250 per unit for new clients, and it really becomes a no-brainer. So text GREEN250 to 21000 or visit them on the web at livegreenlocal.com and tell Marty I think he's gone off the deep end with this absolutely nuts $250 offer. If you're thinking of leaving your W2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is healthcare for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and 
won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason, or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at RCB Associates LLC.com. What do you consider your forte to be, Omar? Because it really seems to me like you're taking a higher level perspective of the whole process of investing in, in multifamily. Where do you bring the rock star? this to this process it's easier for me as an example a lot of times to deal with these investment sales type people purely based on my professional background but it might not be as easy for me to maybe say relating to individual investors so i have people on my team i also try am trying to improve myself there right my skill might be dealing with say more sophisticated tools of capital or investment sales people right And then having the people on my team to ensure that, let's assume we're talking about marketing. I've got a great marketing guy, Sean, right? We're talking about individual investors, how to take care of their emerging needs before it even happens, right? Because that's when you know you're really good at something that, you know, somebody might have something at the back of their head, but they haven't found the right words to articulate it. And you can, you can articulate that concern before they even say it. So they feel like you're reading their mind. Right. But that's only because you've done enough reps for you to know that nine times out of 10, well, if you're going down this path, there's only two or three answers. Right. So there I have a lot of help. And obviously, I have to also improve along the way, but I have to also pick and choose. Right. Because a lot of times I've seen that when I talk to other sponsors, and this works for a lot of investors, I don't do it. They'll give the investor whatever they want to hear. So in the short term, when the investor just wants to give them money, the investor is like, oh, my God, this is a great guy. Just give the guy money. Well, they haven't really given you the whole picture. And something that's held me back is that I'll be like, hey, here's two or three options. I know it doesn't directly answer your question because your question is very open ended. So what I don't want you to do is give you an easy press, tell you to press the easy button. And in the short term, it, it you feel like your question is answered. But in the long term, you'll have there's ramifications to this answer that tends to hold that tends to hold back in terms of new business because people you well if you create a little bit more friction people go for the solution that is frictionless but the people who really appreciate and understand nuance can then understand that okay life is not about easy solutions life is about hey understand what we're in and then customize a solution to your needs so short answer to that is lots of weaknesses i have In those weaknesses, especially around marketing and investor relations, I have people and a great team. My strength is basically dealing with sourcing investments, investment sales, all of that. So I focus myself there, but I do from time to time work on my weaknesses just because you want to become a better person over a period of time. What else do you bring to that conversation when you're talking with brokers, when you're creating those relationships that help you create those pathways where they're going to send you the opportunities before they put it out to everyone else? It's having a track record, number one, but that comes with time. So if you're starting out, it's just not going to happen overnight. But it's also diligently following up. A lot of times, I don't know why people think that if you follow up with somebody like five times or six times, they're going to think you're annoying, right? Well, the fact of the matter is most important people investing in investment sales, they're bombarded with emails, man. I mean, it's getting to the point now where I'm at a stage where I need to hire a full-time executive assistant because my email inbox is flooded now. and I'm not even in investment sales, right? So people who are in investment sales, their inbox must be on flooded on steroids, right? It must be like the great flood of Noah's time, right? So just keep following up. Trust me, professionals who are in the business of sales, do not think it's rude or bad if you politely keep following up just to stay on somebody's radar. So following up is very important. And then, you know, doing what you say and say what you do. So as an example, if a broker shows you a deal, even if you're passing on the deal, give them a reason why you're passing on. Don't be like, well, I passed on the deal. Okay, don't say that. Say, be like, look, I'm passing on the deal. It's hard. I'm just giving you an example, right? It's I'm, I'm having a hard time hitting my... IRR numbers and my cash on cash numbers because I just don't think there's enough rent co- rent pops here. I mean, I need at least 150 as an example rent pops. And when I look at the comps around me, most I can get is $60. Plus, I think the crime is an issue over here because I'm looking at a couple of things. So the demographics and the lack of rent pops is the one that's really causing me concern. So that's why I'm passing. What other deals do you have in the pipeline that could be a good fit? Right? Giving them a reason with instead of saying, I'm passing, I'm done. 
right? Because that you always want to keep the lines of communication open, right? You never want to close them down unilaterally. You don't want to make a sweeping statement and close them down. It seems like in your conversations with brokers, and I'd imagine this extends throughout all your conversations, there's a certain amount of specificity where you're you're not just giving generalities as to what you're looking for or why you're not going to pursue that particular project, but you're giving them specific reasons. Have you found that that really helps kind of dial in on what the quality of what you see after that? I would really like to think so. <laughs> Look, in my particular case, what I think is that if I want to keep the lines of communication open and I want to give people a no BS answer, so if I can't do something, I actually tell them I cannot do it, right? I, I don't say, hey, maybe if this happens and that happens, because if you lay out unreasonable terms and con- I mean, literally all the stars in the universe have to align, right? In that particular case, the broker already realizes you're not a serious person. Or as an example, if the market rate for something is 150,000 a unit and your offer is 98,000 a unit. I mean, dude, you're so far off, man. That I mean, you've got to be at or close to market, right? I mean, nobody at this stage is so stupid that they're just going to give you a freebie, right? So you have to understand that if you're not at or close to market terms, and you want like the perfect deal, a unicorn deal that doesn't exist, it's not even possible, frankly, right? Well, and if you lay out unreasonable conditions and you don't have open lines of communication, people are going to stop talking to you because like that friction thing we talked about with investors, in my opinion, also investment sales guys, especially brokers, they also want to bang heads, man. They, they got a list of five or 10 people they want to reach out to, right? At first, you know, then they'll blast it out, right? So you want to get on this list of five or 10 people, right? And how do you get on this list? It's not always just doing more deals. Well, that really helps if you do deals, but it's also being upfront, forthcoming, and having legitimate, real reasons why you're doing something or not doing something. Let's talk about the asset management part. Do you find yourself doing a lot of the asset management? Well, I mean, I have a team underneath me, but I have to overlook and see everything. And again, that's where the professional background in running and structuring deals, that really comes through because you have to be able to understand to take a deep dive, not just on financial, financially in your P&L, which... I think anybody who's in like third year of finance in college should be able to do. But you also have to play, use common sense. And it's kind of funny now these days, common sense is very uncommon. Right? So you got to have to realize the financial aspect of things, but you also have to realize the operational aspect of things. Like what cert, like if you do X, Y, Z things operationally, for instance, if you're renovating units, right? And your competition is renovating units in three weeks and you're renovating them in one and a half. Well, it chances are you're probably going to be more more occupied with less downtime and make more cash flow and renovate more units at a quicker pace, right? So you have to realize that that there are domino effects, right? Just because something stalled or was done earlier, there are ripple effects to it. Let's assume you put, you renovated a unit in one and a half weeks. It took you another half week to lease the unit, right? In two weeks, you're done. So instead of having a one month turnaround time, now you can renovate two units in one month. Right. So in the same downtime, you can do more work and start generating cash, the higher renovated rent premiums quicker. So taking a step back, understanding there's a financial reason to do things, but there's an operational reason to do things. And how do the operational reasons tie in with the financial results? What other strategies like that do you employ to really make that asset management work in a way that you're adding massive value to the Oh, I have standardized reporting. I could, we, we have standardized reporting across all of our assets. Basically, we have weekly calls and biweekly calls, basically weekly calls for me, but my team, biweekly calls are with my team. There are certain metrics we have to hit every week, every month, every quarter, and we have to just work around those metrics and they're non-negotiable. I mean, non-negotiable in the sense that unless, I don't know, a comet hits the earth or like we have World War III. Short of, short of that, we are non-negotiable, right? We got to do a certain amount of units a month. We need to do it in a certain amount of budget. We need to basically have a certain amount of leasing traffic. Whether we have units or we don't, I don't care. Momentum is very important. We need to be able to ensure that we're ahead of schedule X, Y, Z, and so on and so forth, basically. And a lot of that, to be very honest with you, comes down to standardized reporting and having frequent, like, a regular frequent meeting where you're digging down deep and not having a meeting for the sake of having a meeting, but having clear deliverables that need to be achieved in that meeting. Because, you know, people, you, you probably work in corporations. Corporations love to have meetings. I mean, it's meetings upon meetings upon meetings. 
right now. Have a short, crisp meeting, have two or three key deliverables, and do not confuse your employees. So there's a difference when you have those meetings between looking at the standardized reporting and the KPIs and then acting on that to improve them. And I'm wondering how you handle that, because that's a delicate thing to be demanding without... Oh, it's not delicate, Brian. I mean, my money's on the line, my reputation is on the line, and it's not very delicate. I don't think it's delicate. I mean, look, at, look as an example, you're my investor, right? You have paid me your hard-earned money. That is the sum of your sweat, blood, and tears, right? To accomplish, uh, say, a task or a set of deliverables. I am like, I mean, you know this in real life. You're my investor. I owe a duty of care to you because you could have taken your dollars and invested it in a plethora of other options. But you entrusted me with your hard-earned money. So I have a certain responsibility and set of deliverables to you. Those sets of deliverables, obviously multiplied by the number of investors, have to then get translated into the business plan. And that business plan then has to get translated into a set of tasks and actions on a week, bi-monthly, and monthly basis that are then going to basically ensure that we have the amount of cash flow to send to you, Brian Hamrick, so you think fondly about the next time we talk. And there is no polite way of saying that because you either do it or you don't do it, right? I mean, there is no, well... I kind of did it, but I didn't really do it, right? There, there is no middle ground here. You're also dealing with people on your team who are the ones doing it. When they fall short, when they don't do it, what happens then? Do you just find someone else to do it or do you work with them to help improve them? No, there's two things. So initially we work with them, but also the thing is, it's not like we get to the end stage, right? We know it's not like I've got to send money to Brian and the day I'm supposed to send money to Brian, Five minutes before I'm sending money to Brian, my employee tells me we have no cash. You understand? We don't let it go all the way right to the end. That's why I said we have frequent meetings at regular intervals, multiple times a week, right? So that if there are any... And look, even with this, things happen. So you have to have some slack in the system, right? But along the way, we have a set of like deliverables, micro deliverables, right? That feed up to a bigger deliverable, that feed up to a bigger deliverable. So as an example, if for instance, my renovations are, let's assume I'm supposed to do six renovations a month, I'm behind in January because it's a slow season or let's assume we're 100% occupied, right? And we were, in this happened actually in one or two months where we pushed rents and we got unrenovated units and renovated rents. Well, I mean, that's kind of dumb. Don't do any renovations if somebody's going to pay you the renovated rents because they just want to stay in the apartment. Right, that's kind of dumb. Don't do that. But you know what happens? Next month, we just try to eke out, say, another one or two. The month after that, we eke out another one or two. So over, say, the course of a quarter, we catch up. But we'll only know this if we have frequency of meetings. So if we kind of, for the lack of a better word, screwed up in weeks one and two, then it's not like we get to week 12 and figure out, oh my God, we screwed up. You, you course correct. You're constantly course correcting, right? Because it's like, it's like going like this. And ideally, you want it to go in a straight line. So you're obviously always course collecting along the way. And look, the harsh reality is that I work because I am a recipient of a lot of generosity in life. So I closely work with my team. And in fact, I work with a core group of team members we help them through training modules, one-on-one -on -one advice, coaching, all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, Brad, I mean, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make him drink the water, right? Somebody doesn't want to fix themselves. They don't want to follow their team. They don't want to row in the same direction. I mean, eventually, they got to go, man. But that doesn't always happen. That hardly ever happens. Because most people want to row in the right direction. Most people want to be a part of the team. And they do want to learn from their mistakes. If you coach them and don't point fingers and don't point cast dispersions on people and, you know, kind of deal with it in a normal, civilized, as a civilized human being. I want to talk about the next phase of asset management, which is the liquidation event, whether it be a cash out refi or a sale. And before we started recording, you were telling me about how you're always like every two years you're assessing, OK, do we refi? Do we sell? Talk about that thought process and how you look at that from your position. The way I look at it is I think to myself, like my family, like I told you, I'm the third generation, right? Who's in real estate. My family's been investors for a long time. What we've realized is that 
And obviously, this is not a unique insight we just came up with and nobody else knew. A lot of sponsors, you have to realize a dirty secret in this industry is, which most people don't want, either don't know or don't want you to know or don't want to articulate is that most sponsors, even the honest ethical ones, we make 80 to 90% of our compensation in a deal upon exit. Right, because the asset management fees are frankly a pittance, and the acquisition fee is a one-time fee. But the real bulk of the money you make is upon exit or liquidation event. Well, what do most sponsors do? They want they have their hair on fire trying to as soon as they buy, they want to sell because as soon as they sell, they can get a, a nicer chunk of money. And in their estimation, they think, well, you know, I could hold on to an asset for another year, and the asset value might go up 10, 15 percent, and you know, my investors get 10, 15 percent more of their money, or I can take slightly less money because my paycheck, my cut of the deal might only be a five or seven percent difference. But to you as an investor, every year, if you're getting an additional 10, 15 percent, that's a nice chunk of change. So I put myself in my family's position and in our investors' position and realize, look, it is in my best interest, as an example, finance, my personal financial interest, as an example, the deal you're invested in, we're already getting very nice offers, right? So financially speaking, it is in my best interest to just go sell it, cash my check, and then on paper, at least I can show an even higher IRR. Because one of the stupid things about the IRR is the earlier you exit, even if you leave money on the table, your IRR number looks higher. So everybody's like, oh my God, you must be a genius, right? In our particular case, what we realized is you make the money on the buy, right? Long-term generational wealth, you make a money on the buy. You don't make it on the sell, right? So for in the right market at the right time, I structure my deals in an open-ended manner. Again, this is where the professional financial knowledge comes into being, that I always have the option of either selling, because you know, at the end of the day, if somebody gives me a price that's frankly too good to be true, then yeah, everything's for sale at the right price, right? I mean, let's, let's be honest, right? So, but we have the option of either selling or refinancing. So in your particular case, what we did with this deal is we refinanced and returned close to about a third or 32% of the money in 19 months, plus all the distributions you're getting along the way, right? And now the idea there is we got a loan that we're in two years time. If you want to refinance this deal again, we can get out without any penalties or like very minimal penalties, right? I mean, it's, it's like a rounding error, right? So the idea hopefully is to constantly be on this refinance pathway unless you're selling. Refi, return a chunk of money. Because as an example, if you give me a hundred bucks, I return a third of it every 19 months. Well, what is 19 times three? Well, in 57 months, I've already returned to you 100% of your capital back, not including all the distributions you got paid along the way. Plus, you are already a member in this deal. So, man, you keep cashing your double-digit cash-on-cash check for eternity, basically, right? And you tell me, how many safe, stable businesses can you eke out double-digit cash-on-cash? I mean, I don't know a lot, right? So that's the idea. Be flexible. Be always open-ended, but be in a position where our investors long-term are having that advantage. Even if in the short term, it comes at the expense of me not, say, getting a nice paycheck this quarter or this year, because that's fine. Long-term, this is in both my investors' interest and my own personal long-term financial interest to make sure, because I have to go to the same well over and over again, that it's my moral and ethical duty as well to make sure my investors' returns and their long-term wealth is well taken care of. One of the challenges that I always face when it comes to that decision making that you just talked us through, that liquidation event, do we do a cash out refi? Do we sell? It is that prepayment penalty. Yeah. So we don't have it. That's the way we, we had like a 1%, one point on it max. How do you manage to put a loan in place where you don't have that pre-penalty? So I'll explain to you as a thing that, which is seems very obvious, but I don't know why more people don't know about it. Most real estate people or most people who are successful in one area of life, for whatever reason, in my, in my limited experience on the planet, feel like if I am successful in one area of life, I must be successful in every area of life. So it's always funny to me that I know lots of traders, professional traders, work on institutional banks, right? They trade currencies, they trade interest rates, and they don't know all the time where interest rates are going. I mean, they can follow the curve, but... You know, I mean, they can't tell you with 100% certainty where things are going. And it's always funny to me that I talk to real estate sponsors, experienced or otherwise, and they say it with such definitiveness where the Fed is going to go raise, whether the Fed is going to raise or not raise the interest rates. Because 
Apparently, if you bought two real estate deals, you know everything the way the Fed works. That's the mantra these days, right? So in my opinion, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And what I don't know is the inner workings of the Fed or frankly, how interest rates are going to move up or down. So why take a bet when I don't have to take a bet? So what I do is I always get floating rate loans. I have a rate cap, which is a fancy way of saying that I cap my upside, right? So if rates go above a certain level, my counterparty pays me. It's like buying a derivative, right? And then you just sit back and relax. Because why get into a fight? Why pick a fight on topics you're not well informed of, you have no control over, and frankly, you don't know your head from your ass on, right? But so I don't like to pick those kind of fights. But it's very funny. Like I keep meeting people and they think they bought two houses or two apartment buildings and suddenly they know more than every other person who does this for a living. So that's a long and short answer to that. It sounds like you get a floating rate and you buy a rate cap. Yeah. And then you go to sleep, man. That's it. Literally. Do not do not overcomplicate it. Keep things simple. Do not overcomplicate it. And when you have that floating rate. If the only penalty is one on agencies, the only penalty is one point on your loan. And frankly, you can even negotiate that because if you're refining multiple times with the same loan brokers, you can get them to eat some of that penalty. Some of it, not all of it. So you get a little bit of discount there as well. And frankly, look, if you're doing a good job, that 1% penalty isn't going to kill you. Okay? Because you'll more than make up for it the next time you basically refi. But if you've got these fixed rate loans, where you're basically tied. And I mean, you have to sacrifice your firstborn before you get out of this loan, right? Man, you're going to be in a world of hurt. Omar, as we wrap it up, what advice do you have for our listeners right now, whether it be about the multifamily market, looking out as the long-term projections that you might have, or any other advice that you would like to share? Well, I'd like to state explicitly, I'm not in the projections business of like macroeconomic trends, because frankly, I worked on the trading desk and I know nobody knows what they're talking about. So I don't like to get into that sort of business. Look, my opinion is the same as say what my parents told me. And I'm sure what lots of parents told me. If something's too good to be true, it probably is. So if you're looking at say a multifamily deal in Atlanta, right right now, class B multifamily deal. And one sponsor is telling you, I'm going to get a 30% IRR. And the other guy's going to tell you, look, I'm going to get 14 to 16% IRR, right? Well, the chances are nine times out of, or in fact, 10 times out of 10, the guy who's saying a 30% IRR is just blowing smoke up your butt. Okay. It's not possible. Drug dealers don't have this kind of margin all the time. Okay. Maybe you'll hit a home run occasionally, right? I mean, that's fine. But these things don't happen in real life. So always go with people who are reasonable, even though in the short term, you you have this fear of missing out because you see this guy has a better deal on paper, right? Go with reasonableness. The point is to stay in the game, multiply your money long term, and never lose your money. Never deal with shady characters. Never deal with some guy who's super flashy because we're in real estate, okay? Don't overcomplicate things. So stay in your lane, be conservative, just be down the fairway, and things will be fine long term. Omar, how would people find out more about you or get in touch with you? So you can go to my website, boardwalkwealth.com, B-O-A-R-D, walkwealth.com, right on the front page on the right side. There's an email opt-in form. So just put your name, email address, how you found out about us. You can also email me, umar, O-M-A-R, at boardwalkwealth.com. It's been a pleasure having this higher level conversation with you. And I really appreciate you taking us through the process of how you acquire the assets through your broker communications and and relationships, your philosophy on asset managing, and then the thought process you put into the liquidation event, whether it be a cash out refi or a sale. And I especially love that you shared the floating rate and buying the cap on that. That is great information that you shared today. So thank you very much for having this conversation. I really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, now offering a $250 per unit project allowance to new clients in West Michigan. Find out more at livegreenlocal.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. 
You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review.